Okay, uh, my name is John Ellinger. They call me Ellie for short. You know, in those days they used your last name and then uh, made nicknames like that type of thing. And I was in the 433rd uh, Fighter Squadron, 475th Fighter Group. In fact, I was initially pulled out of the 39th Fighter Squadron, which was the initial P-38 Squadron in New Guinea. And uh, they pulled six of us out and we went down to Brisbane, Australia to form the initial nucleus of the 475th Fighter Group. So you were one of the original members in total. In, in June 43, we went down there, yes. And we got replacements from the states to build us up into squadrons of enough personnel to maintain 16 aircraft on the line, ready to go, per squadron. And I was in the initial cadre. And then I, due to the fact I had four months of a combat experience, I was a flight leader. An element leader, you might say, element leader. We had elements of four, right? I was an element leader, yes. So what the, how old were you at, at this uh, time period? Well, I joined the Air Force as an aviation cadet one week after Pearl Harbor. I just turned 21 years old. So I went through nine months of training, a month of training in a P-38, and they sent me over as a fighter pilot to Australia, Brisbane, Australia. So I was 21, 21 and a half at that time. Right. Were you, so you were over there uh, when Lindbergh was over there, right? No, Lindbergh came in. You see, I was in the initial cadre in June, and once we formed the group, we went back to New Guinea to operate. And now we had some firepower with all these P-38s. And I, I don't know the exact time Lindbergh got over there, but I stayed until May of 44, and then I came home. And I believe Lindbergh was in that period of time when he came over. I don't know the exact date. Some of the other people, like Loisel, the commander, which is here, the group commander could tell you that. And he saw him. And I had a squadron commander uh, Warren Lewis, who died in February, one of the greatest fighter pilots ever born, I think, and uh, uh, he knew Lindbergh, and uh, he had a, a funny deal. We used to go out fishing for fish in Mor Moresby, and so uh, the, the group commander in Lindbergh was in one raft, and Warren Lewis was in the other raft. He was going to spot the fish. And they were using Japanese hand grenades to stun the fish, to bring them up and then collect them. <laughs> and Warren Lewis said, OK, here they are. And so Lindbergh st stood up in the raft, leaned back to throw the grenade. And he lost his balance and threw the grenade. And it landed about two feet from my squadron commander and blew him out of the water, practically. <laughs> it was a funny story. Anyway, that was all I know about Lindbergh. But I wasn't there when he was there, no. So did you did you come back to the states as an instructor pilot then? Or? Oh, I came back. Uh, yeah, in May of '44, and I went to uh, Moses Lake, Washington, uh, and I was an instructor up there in uh, P-39s of all things, which is war weary airplanes, and uh, and eventually we did get P-38s. But I was an instructor up there taking people out of uh, cadet training and training them into combat tactics, dive bombing and all that sort of thing, formation flying, that type of thing. Yeah, I was an instructor at that time. So did you, did you stay in the military after that? No, we, we got tied up with one of the colonels there and he wanted to formulate a, uh, a P-38 gunnery school. And they ended up down in Daggett, California, near Barstow. And we were pulling in instructors from all the base units and teaching them how we went up Death Valley and flew at tow targets and shot at tow targets to teach them approaches to hitting a target. And we were instructing them on how to shoot down or shoot a target, right? So we were instructing the instructors 
of the air base units in California at that time. And then I got out in November 45. And I went to college three years at UCLA, but then I got the bug and got back in the Air Force. And I stayed in until 1966, 22 years in the Air Force. And if you want me to cover history or yeah, what? Okay, I, I went back in and they, this is where this double Mustang comes in. I uh, was approached uh, on a reserve thing in Tucson, a two week active duty uh, by a team that wanted to find instructors to fly uh, 51s, P-51s at that time, and instruct in them. And I said, oh, that sounds great to me. And so I applied, and they called me six months later, and they sent me to active duty, but the, not P-51s. It's called an F-82, which is a double Mustang. Somebody dreamed up the idea of taking two, 50, two 51s and putting them together, see? Two individual fuselages. Not like a 38, two individual fuselages with a common stabilizer, common wing. It was a weird airplane, actually. You sit in one cockpit and you look over 30 feet and there's the other guy sitting in the other cockpit. Huh? So I uh, was assigned to that group and I flew to them for uh, 350 hours. And in fact, the, uh, and the side to this, the F-82, over in Korea, when the Korean thing came about, uh, was the first airplane to shoot down a small, uh, not a jet, but a small conventional aircraft of the North Viet, uh, uh, North Koreans. I think it was a Yak-9 or something like that. And then after that, I uh, said, uh, I'm in the Air Force, I need a secondary occupation, so not only a stick and rudder man, I got to do something else. So I went to uh, Denver, Colorado and got into air intelligence and photo interpretation. And I leaned toward reconnaissance and photo interpretation. So then I was assigned to go over to Japan and Korea as a, a recon photo interpreter, you know, take the photographs that are taken and interpret the things. Find out bomb damage assessment and all that business. And then on the side, being a pilot, I wanted to fly, so I went down and I said, you got uh, P-51s down here, right? I said, I've flown 51s. And they said, okay, well, you can fly for us on a volunteer basis. So our deal was to go out at 1,000 feet up near the DMZ and try and find opportunity targets and pull in the fighters to knock off the targets. Well, you know, a 51, is an inline, air, uh, not air-cooled, but liquid-cooled engine. And if you get one shot in a coolant and you get a leak, you're good for 15 minutes, you've got to ditch the thing. It wasn't the airplane to use for that operation. They lost nine guys in three months. And I was a volunteer, and I said, I'm leaving, goodbye. <laughs> so we had another squadron of, uh, of photo uh, RF-80s, which was a jet. I'd never flown a jet, so I got checked out in the jet. Now I flew at 20,000 feet taking photographs. And that went along real fine. I'm doing the interpretation of photographs, flying the, the missions, taking the photos. And one day, two of us went up on an instrument check, and we were up there, and uh, we saw a bunch of contrails way up there going south. And I said, you know, that's not F-86s. I think those are MiGs. And eight, eight contrails, you know what a contrail is, they broke off. And I said, you think they see something? You know, it might be us. So we peeled off and went to the deck, and they caught us at 10,000 feet. And I looked back and I saw that big nose of an F-15. I mean, uh, uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, I'm not saying the right word. It's the uh, Russian version, you know, the 15, the jet. Okay. And I said, well, I'd been in gunnery training previous to that, so I knew as soon as they came in and started their curve on me, I just racked into them, and they went screaming by in this jet. And uh, I knew they, they were sucking fuel or <laughs> vapors, so they went back up to altitude and went home. So that's how I got away from the, F, the uh, MiG-15s, the MiG-15s. 
So I, I got away from them because I had no guns. I had nothing but uh, cameras. So anyway, and then I came home. <laughs> that was my recon experience. So following that, I went into um, an instructor in uh, bomb damage assessment radar, help, helping SAC determine uh, RBI sites. And uh, see, when uh, SAC did their training for bombing, we didn't have any actual photographs of the German, I mean, uh, Russian cities. But we could, uh, we could make simulations that these uh, bombers could use in a uh, sonic trainer. They, would they could use a, a bridge and all that and they call RBI sites and offset bombing and bomb that city even though they've never seen it before. And SAC trained on what we produced. See? From that, I went into, uh, gee, I did that for 10 years, and I got antsy because I wanted to get back to real flying. And I got into 118s, which is like a DC-6, and flew for mats for four years. And then I transitioned into uh, the C-135, which was a four-engine jet. And I flew that internationally with the military for four years. I retired in 66. And then I flew for World Airways International Charter Operation for 14 years commercially. And then I retired again in 1980. That's essentially my uh, historical background. And uh, now I just fly for pleasure. I'm a retired military, so I fly at Beale Air Force Base, which is up north of Sacramento. And I fly a little airplanes, you know. And that's, I'm not an ace. I didn't shoot anybody down to get confirmed. I, I think I saved a lot of people, you know, and saved a lot of bombers from getting shot down, et cetera, et cetera. But that's, that's kind of my story, in essence. Now, uh, uh, do you have any questions? <laughs> Tell me, um, I'm going to ask you two questions. And uh, I've... Uh -huh. I was in uh, Desert Storm, so I know a little bit about what it's like to be in a war. Not not like you guys. Yes. But totally different. Yeah. But I, I know you have good days and bad days in, in a war zone. Yeah. So let me ask you, what what was your worst day that you can remember during World War II? Well, I'll tell you. Yeah, uh, I'll. Uh, let's say you go out on a mission. Okay. First, you got to find the enemy, right? So it's constant uh, neck turning. Right, looking, looking, trying to spot the enemy before they spot you. To me, that was the big uh, uh, fear concept, you might say, of what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to happen. And therefore, uh, generally speaking, that was the worst part of any mission. But once it starts, you know, and, and all the action starts, and you go into a fighter deal and you start ramrodding it around and shooting at people, all the fear concept is gone. You know, and it's all over in about five minutes. You wonder, what the hell happened? Where'd they go? And it all happened so fast that uh, after that, uh, there's no, and then you say, oh boy, it's over. You know, and you come home. See, uh, that's what we go through as a, in those days as a fighter pilot, because we didn't have the high technology of radars and spotting people. We did it all visually. And you know how we navigated in New Guinea? If you've ever seen an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper, and if you know, look at a picture of New Guinea, it looks like a prehistoric animal. And we had it one, two, three, four, down to 10, nine, over here, A, B, C, D, and little squares. And okay, they'd say, okay, you're supposed to meet the B-24s it's so-and-so on this little map at such-and-such such a time. And we'd eyeball it. We had no uh, radars, no navigation instruments. We did it all visually. And we went out there and met the bombers and then escorted them to the target. We did it all on a piece of paper about this big. I wish they had a piece, uh, a copy of that thing we used in those days. It would be very interesting. I've never seen one. Never seen a reproduction. But to me, that's the essence of a mission. You see? I don't know if that answers your question. It did. 
Tell me, what, what do you think was your best day that you ever had? The best day? <laughs> you mean over there? Okay. I got out of the fight and I didn't get shot down. <laughs> and that happened many times. <laughs> I can't say. You know, I flew 165 missions, had 300 combat hours. And so um, um, I wanted to do my job. And, and, and what I say is the camaraderie of the group and the guys you're working with and working together, which is the best thing, and you come back together. You know what I mean? Without losing somebody. I think that's the best part of it all, in essence. I think you gave me a, uh, a name already, but uh, who do you consider to be the best commander that you had in? Oh, without doubt, Warren Lewis. Uh, you may have him on tape. I'm sure you must have him on tape. He was, uh, I think he was in the 432nd or the 431st Squadron as a captain, and we had a terrific uh, leader over there of our squadron, uh, Danny Roberts, and uh, one of his wingmen ran into him. They ran into each other and crashed and burned during a fight. And Warren Lewis jumped the gun. He was only a captain at the time. It usually took a major to take over a squadron commander's shot, but he came over, and he. Uh, he was really great. I mean, this guy was a terrific commander. He knew how to handle people. You know, if you did something wrong, he'd just bring you in and straighten you out real easy like or put you on the stick and make you so loyal that you would go to hell and high water for him. You know, he was that kind of a guy. And in fact, uh, uh, he, as of late of Vietnam, he was a wing commander over in F-100s in uh, Vietnam. Terrific guy, and uh, everybody has said he was one of the best that they've ever seen. And I, I went to his burial in Texas in February when he died uh, this year. Yeah, he was the best. He was the best. Warren Lewis. You look in your records, you'll find a tape on him, I'm sure. No better. Now, now I know, I know you all have funny stories there because there are certain funny things take place. What? Tell me a funny story that you remember from <laughs> your time away. Well, I don't know if this is, well, this is kind of exotic in a way. I, I relate it to escaping from death. You might say, is that funny? Um, one day we came back from a mission, and we had uh, sixteen of us. And there was a terrific rainstorm. You know, we went visual and went down the coastline, and we couldn't see the airport, Dobadur, I think it was. And so this leader said he was going to take his three guys and go in there and look for it. And I had kind of bad radio, and I, I thought, well, why aren't these guys following him? So I took my three guys, and I went under him like this, you know, flying formation, and this scud at about 800 feet. And he didn't find it, and all of a sudden his number two man started fading off. And I said, oh, I'm in trouble. So I said, guys, make a 180 and let's get out of here. So we went this way to go back to the coast to get into visual conditions. And on the way back, I'm drilling along, and all of a sudden four engines come at me, and it's a, a B-24 head on. <laughs> and, and I dropped down, I said, hey, guys, drop your flaps and psh, we dropped it around, and all of a sudden, we're flying formation with this B-24, see? <laughs> and I contacted him on communication, and I said, hey, you're looking for the, the strip, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I said, you got Navigator, and you got better stuff than we have. Now, let's find it. So we went in there and made two runs. Finally, we found it, and we landed. But that's, I don't know if you call that a funny story, but it was an oddball story, wasn't it? <laughs> But fun, I don't know. Probably my worst, you want me to tell you a secret, my worst experience over there was uh, one day uh, there were 10, we spotted 10 Japanese and there was 10 of us. And we all uh, started milling around and going down after these guys. And 
one guy went through a cloud and I chased him and I went through the cloud and I didn't find him and all of a sudden I looked down there and here's all the rest of the P-38s chasing this one zero, see? And uh, evidently they'd shot down all the rest of them. So I had altitude, so I dove down in front of all these guys and I came up behind this guy and I fired all the ammunition I had at this guy. I, I think I was out of range a little bit, or something was wrong because I don't care where I pointed the pipper. You know, we didn't have automated, automated uh, direction things like they have now. You know, it was all eyeball stuff. And I shot everything I had, and he's still flying. So I peeled off, <laughs> and the next guy come up behind me and just made one burst, and the guy went down and hit the deck, you know, in the water. <laughs> <laughs> That's probably my worst moment over there. I think about that all the time. You can scrub that one. <laughs> That's not a good one for me. <laughs> Honesty. Anyway. Tell me, what did you think about your, your ground crew people? Oh, terrific. Terrific because the conditions of New Guinea, you know, very humid conditions. If you've been in Florida in high summer and high temperatures, you know what I mean. High humidity, perspiration. They used to work with just pants on. and they, To keep a, an airplane that intricate, like a P-38 flying properly, they did a fantastic job. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here now because they kept everything going. They were top notch. And in fact, uh, that's where Warren Lewis came into the, uh, he was such a good commander, he took his uh, adjutant and we used to, trade rot gut uh, whiskey, which we got from Sydney on R&R, &R, and go down to the docks where the merchant vessels were. And most all of the cooks on merchant vessels are alcoholics. And we trade them this cheap booze, and we get a couple of cases of pork chops or something, bring them back, and we feed the whole squadron. So uh, we had lousy food over there, you know? I don't know if you heard about bully beef, but that that's... <laughs> That's, that's a concoction that won't quit. It's, it's very greasy. It's not like Spam. Spam is a delicacy compared to bully beef. And we had that in what they call 180 degree butter. It had to get to 180 degrees before it would melt. So you know what that is. And that and the powdered eggs. And uh, even then, the cooks tried to make it palatable. But uh, over, overall, uh, until the Japanese shot down all the merchant vessels and sunk them. Uh, you heard PJ talk today about the Australian uh, rations. Uh, well, they call it, uh, it was a, uh, a stew, but it was mutton stew. There's a difference between mutton and lamb. And this stuff, it was so potent that you lean over it and the odor, uh, I couldn't eat it. And I, for three months, I lived on coffee, peanut butter, and jam until our rations came back, and I could not stand the Australian rations. <laughs> okay, that's an aside, but that's part of the history of this thing. That's a great history of the thing. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So, so tell me, what, what did you, I think I know the answer to this, but I just want to hear from you. What did you think of the P-38 as an airplane? Well... Personally, looking back on it, I thought it was one of the most smoothest. If you've ever heard a get in there and close the cockpit and listen to a hum, uh, like I used to relegate it to the uh, sound of a Cadillac, you know. This thing had, uh, you know, it was liquid cooled, supercharged, did not have these stacks that come out and make all this noise like a P-51 and all these airplanes. It was very smooth, and the exhaust went out the top through the turbo superchargers, and it was just like a hummer. You know, you get in there and it hums. And you, with the counter-rotating props, which went this way, see, you had no torque. So when you went, no matter what speed you changed to, see, most airplanes that are single engine, like a 51, every time you change speed or anything, you have torque involved, which means you have to feed in rudder and ailerons and all this to stabilize the thing to where it can go where you want it to go. But with a 38, you just dump it and it goes where you point it because there's no t torque involved 
where you get torque is something that wants to roll the airplane. See, a 38 is solid, just straight. And when you get that in the 450s and the 20 millimeter in front of you, you got a fire platform that won't quit. And to me, that was the great deal about it, and especially in the islands where we were, over water, flying four and five hour missions, you know? If you lose an engine, forget it. Don't worry about it. You can come back, right? You can even fight on one engine. You know, and it was our tactics, the 300 miles an hour and, and uh, uh, two, uh, you know, a leader and a, a wingman that made the difference over there. It was the speed that counted. We didn't try and outmaneuver uh, zero. You've seen one out here. You'll see one tomorrow if you're out there. The zero is a fantastic maneuverable machine, but it did not have the airspeed that we had. So we just hit and run and come back and hit them again. See, that was the tactic. That's what saved our butt. Yeah. Uh, getting anything worth saving? I've got a lot worth saving, let me tell you. Okay. All right, now just just an honest old John here. This is, this is great. <laughs> You know, this this will probably be one of my, my final questions for you. Okay. Um, Tom Brokaw wrote a book some years ago called The Greatest Generation. Yes, I read it. And you guys happen to be that generation. Yes. When you hear that and you're called that, how do you feel about that? Well, you know, it's a difference. Of, you know, World War II to me was a real war. It was a war of survival of us. We never had anybody invade us, have we? Not really, except Al-Qaeda. Uh, no, we went to other places and fought other wars, but we fought to save our, ourselves, right? So to me, it was a, a logical way. There was no way we couldn't go into World War II, right? Philosophically, politically, anyway. See what I mean? And to me, that's the idea of World War II, uh, the generation he's talking about. Now, I have my own ideas. Now, other wars, Vietnam, should have never happened. Uh, Ho Chi Minh, uh, they said he was a communist. What the hell is a communist? He went to France and had a few lessons in communism. And what did the French do? They tried to go over there, an imperialistic thing, and take over their country. Ho Chi Minh was trying to save his country. He came to us for help, and we turned him down. We said, next on you, you're a communist. So what do we end up doing? We go over there and be advisors, and end up there having a hell of a war, uh, expending 55,000 of our lives, fighting a war which should have never happened in the first place. See what I mean? And look at this Iraq thing. See, how can you say the greater generation in Iraq? Yeah, we have great volunteers out there uh, being killed every day. But, you know, politically, and uh, it's the worst thing that's ever happened to the United States, the Iraq war. See, Bush is a, <laughs> he condoned and waited and, and got what he wanted to fight something he didn't know what he was fighting. Just like the Vietnamese. We went over to Vietnam we didn't know anything about the culture of Vietnam. We knew nothing about these people. And you know, culture is a very important thing. You have to know the people that you're trying to help. But we're gonna save the, the world from communism. What a bunch of BS. That's BS. That's all I can say about the, the generation. But World War II and Brokaw was right at that time. You know, it was, condoned because it's in a package of World War II. Now, you can say that about other things later historically, right? About Iraq, et cetera, et cetera. The people aren't the problem. The politicians are the problem. Hey, look, they, they cannot be diplomatic enough to solve the problems, so they call on the military to do their fighting for them. 
you cannot solve anything militarily. There's never been anything solved militarily except subdue some people. And that doesn't solve the problem. You see what I mean? You have to have political solving. Well, I, I know I'm philosophizing a lot, but that, that's my idea on wars. Okay. <laughs> Is there anything you'd like to add at all? To anything? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> All right? Yeah, would you like to add something? Is there something you'd like to say? To well, I think you people have been very nice in listening to my, my gab here and uh, all that. But, you know, I have my own ideas about things. But, uh, sure. To young people today? If, young, huh? What would you say to young people today about? Uh, to young people today? Yeah, well, about what? War or what? About solving your political problems in war. Well, I think, you know, it's, you know, the trouble with politicians are they're buttering their own ass all the time, and, and they got a big sign up there that says for sale. You know what I mean? Give me the money, and I'll do what you want me to do, right? I know this is very, very nasty, but that's the way it is. If you look back on it, they do everything for money. Look at what it costs to be a politician and get elected. Money, money, money. And when all that money comes in, you, ha you can't turn a blind face to these people. You have to do something for them, right? So what are you going to say? Uh, I know that uh, as a, a peon in my class, uh, we don't do enough politicizing and joining things that maybe we ought to get on the Internet more. I think from our standpoint as a common person, we ought to get it on the internet and just blast them with stuff constantly because we got the technology to do it. And if you get them blasted enough, maybe they'll listen to you because you can't, it's too hard to go out and join organizations. I know a lot of people do. I never have because I pull back and don't do it. And I'm remiss because uh, I can't blame the politicians because they're doing what they do, and uh, I, I'm at fault for not fighting them. But you know, you can only fight so much. But I think we have an opportunity technologically these days with young people, if they believe in something, to do it on the internet and blast everybody that they know, politicians like Doolittle and everybody else in California. You know, I think that might be an out. I don't know if it's gonna be effective, but I would say, Stand by your principles. Don't be an asshole and take money for everything, right? Uh, people are, you know, everything can be bought at a price, isn't it? If somebody offers you a million dollars to go out and screw your wife, what are you going to do? Are you going to give them the million dollars? Are you going to take it or not? You've got to have principles. And you have to have faith. And they say uh, religion and state should be separated. <laughs> you can't do it. Everybody has religion one way or another, or else they don't have, right? You have your own thoughts about it. Maybe you can't mix it, but it's going to introduce yourself into what you say and what you say yes or no, isn't it? How can you separate it? So stand by your principles and go for it. That's all I can say.